My people, welcome back. You're listening to Rooted Souls. Yay, I'm so excited. We're back today with Ailey Williams Spooner. On our last episode, we talked about all things manifestation. She's a positive psychologist and well being consultant based in London, England. And you can learn more about her on our episode 33. And we're back today for episode 34 to follow up on our manifestation episode and talk about taking action or not taking action and all the ins and outs of creation, conscious creation. So welcome back, Ailey. Thank you for having me again. I'm so excited to be here. So when people talk about conscious creation, they often think about what do I do to make it happen? Hmm. But you and I have talked about this a lot. It's not always about taking action. It's oftentimes about the way we think and our internal dialogue. And on the far other end of the spectrum, people think they shouldn't do anything at all. I should just think about it and it should all be delivered to me. But as you and I know, and maybe many of the listeners know, nothing's black and white in life. And it just depends on the situation and depends on where you're at. Would you like to dive in and share a little bit about how to determine when to take action and what are what is the opposite of action and what conscious creation really looks like as a conscious creator? Yes, I'll be very happy to do that. Did you want to redefine what manifestation is for those who are just joining us for the first time or were a bit confused in the last episode? I think that'd be great. Mm-hmm. So manifestation essentially is creating consciously with your thoughts. It is how your internal state, your imagination affects the world around you. So visualizations, affirmations, intentions, you set a focus on having specifically what you would want to experience or having a goal achieved and you experience it as if you already have it and it manifests physically into the world around you. Would you like to add anything to that? I'm not sure. Yeah, I'm, I'm thinking about um, the skeptics and how silly and strange that sounds. Um, and I like to remind people that we are always having an internal dialogue, always having internal thoughts. Um, some people more than others. Other people can you know, have more of a quiet experience, but many people, especially creatives, have a lot going on inside their head. And it's just what we experience internally often that we take as truth, right? And so that's what's happening around us. That's why um, if we have an opinion about something, it's proven true to us. That's why it's our opinion because that's what we're experiencing. So with conscious creation, it takes repetition and sometimes time, not always, to think a different thought and see something else unfold. Now, this can sound like very magical thinking, But the invitation is just to try it out and see what happens because you might be very surprised. Definitely. It is all your thoughts creating your life and your beliefs and your reactions and then your actions. So your thoughts are essentially the foundation of everything that you experience in your life. Depending on how you perceive something, which is essentially your assumptions and your thoughts, will determine every single experience that you have. because everything comes from that one point and then branches outwards and it's interesting even though there can be skeptics and that's understandable like we always question things and it's good to question things because that's how you grow that's how you learn but if you take a logical perspective of understanding that before you speak you will have a thought or a lot of people will have a thought and it's very interesting because there's more of research into internal monologue and people that don't have internal monologue and I find that fascinating so some people do have a very quiet existence and they experience things more visually or in emotions more so than internal words and having thoughts in sentences so the way we experience things can be different internally but that is still an internal state before it becomes external So it's a lot of interesting connections when you just take a logical approach to manifesting that can help when you're feeling a bit skeptical or like you're doubting it. But as Becca said, try it yourself and see what happens. 
I think an important distinction to make uh, is about what comes first, the emotion or the thought, because one of the uh, main pieces of law of attraction is that your feelings, your emotions, your vibration is creating. And what you and I share uh, is the belief that the law of assumption is actually the driving factor. It's the thought that comes first. Yeah. And it's so funny. My mind said, what comes first, the chicken or the egg? <laughs> that was my response internally to what comes first, thought or emotion. And I think it is actually very, very similar to the chicken or the egg because does it necessarily matter which one technically comes first? Like they both have the same outcome. So whichever one makes more logical sense to you, you stick with. But personally, from my experience and my experience with my clients and seeing how they work and how their thoughts happen and their emotions, when you dig past the emotions, there's generally a thought that has triggered that emotion in the first place. So if you're feeling angry or sad, that's just such a, a basic emotion as well because a lot of the time when you are feeling angry or sad it is so much more it is because you're feeling rejected or resentful or ignored or like a basic human need isn't being met in that moment when you narrow it back down it won't just be I'm angry I'm sad it'll be this person has said something to me specifically that has triggered me and the thought in response to that situation this is you being reactory instead of actually choosing your response will be the emotion so it is the thought of this person has disrespected me that causes the anger that causes the triggered response of saying something or doing something because your perception of that situation is that the person isn't treating you right. And then all your actions come from that perception, including your emotion. So I personally believe it is thought, emotion, response, or thought, emotion, reaction. I would agree. And I think a good way to um, integrate this um, framing is that it's the narrative that creates the emotion, right? So if you believe somebody is being rude to you, you could be upset. If you believe that they are um, unaware, you could be more calm about it. So the emotion is directly in, re in relation to the narrative, which is thought. So the law of assumptions also tied up with the law of belief and emotions change, right? Like if you hold a belief, it's something that is more ingrained and if you choose to change the belief, then the emotions will follow. And mm -hmm. since a mood can fluctuate, um, it's, it's just much more um, impressionable or malleable. So a mood is more malleable or? Uh, yeah, a mood. Maybe that's not more. the right word. Emotion. Emotion is more in motion. It's more changing and shifting. Mm -hmm. But what malleable. And, and malleable, um, but we can change our beliefs. We can change our thoughts. And that's why this is sometimes hard for people to grasp because it seems like we are who we are. Yeah. Reality keeps showing us the same thing over and over again, unless we consciously choose to change it. That's the thing with manifestation is that you get what you are, not what you want. And that's the same within life get what you are not always what you want so if you are something that you are really happy with I'm rich for example everybody's always happy with that one you will see evidence of that you'll see that you have money you can see that you can go out and do the things that you want to do life matches what you believe that you are if you feel that you are poor and you are constantly having the thought process of I'm poor I can't afford this I have debt I never have enough and then you are wanting to be rich, but always living from a state of I never have enough and I'm poor, you will never have enough. You will never be rich. Even if you had a million pounds or dollars, it would still never be enough. Suddenly you want to buy an island somewhere and you don't have enough money for that and then you feel poor. So it's like, or you start to invest badly and then the money drops and it's gone. And then again, you are still poor because you always act and respond and live life and get what you are, not what you want. So that's what manifestation is as well. It's changing who you believe that you are through internal processes of thought, changing your thoughts and building 
better thought patterns so that you can say I am loved I am wanted I am rich and I am doing really well and you are experiencing those things as well and affirmations can be a double-edged sword because if you don't believe it it can sometimes cause resistance when you're saying it but on the other hand it's repetition and after a while you've brainwashed yourself to believe it to be true definitely this is a good segue to talk about action or not action because we're talking about internal processes now. So that is a kind of action, um, but we can also take external action. So do you want to define what action taking is with manifestation or what it is not, if you can? Yeah, sure. So as you said, action can either be internal or external. So in society in life we are very much driven to be doing external action no one really talks about internal action as much and when they do sometimes it comes across as very like woo woo or psychotherapist or like deep deep trauma and shadow work and it can come off in that way instead of being just like a general thing that you do in your daily life external action we're very much encouraged to apply for that job and go to those meetings and work really hard and be on all the dating apps and do all the external actions in order to get to what you want but the internal action is often very much misrepresented and underrepresented in terms of monitoring your thoughts looking at your emotions Understanding that when things come up, you can work through them. Having good habits in terms of the way you're thinking about yourself, the way you're thinking about yourself in the relation to the things around you. And that's your self-concept, essentially, those two things. That's internal versus I need to be doing, 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 doing to get something physically, to make something happen. And as you said, there's so much like double-edged swords with this because... If we feel like we're not in the state of having something that we want, so for example, feeling in an unloved state and then trying to convince someone to love you, (laughs) that never gets the result that people want. It never gets the result that I've seen with my clients. It's always you have to change your state into I'm feeling confident, I'm feeling loved, and then things reflect that back to you. So even if you take an action from the same state of the thing that you would want to experience, so changing into an I'm love state to experience a more loving, healthy, happy relationship, then the external action that you take will be from that state, not from an external, you know, you get into the I'm not love state and then you do the, you do the action and it's just it's such a big circle so I always I when I speak about this I always feel like I go around in a loop myself it's like I start talking about internal it's like oh external and then external to internal it's just such a loop so how do you shift for example to a loving state if you're in feeling an unloved state so you would focus on how would it feel to be loved how would that physically feel how would that feel in the sense of a visualization or what thoughts would you be thinking how would you be responding to situations and then you go from there going from a unloved to love state you would go internally so go into your mind close your eyes sometimes closing your eyes helps because then you're just shutting out the world around you and you're just focusing on okay What thoughts am I currently thinking? And sometimes that is that I'm not worthy of this relationship. I am not good enough or I'm not receiving the type of love that I would like. Uh, I'm unloved. I'm unwanted. Those thoughts, you just acknowledge them because that's absolutely fine. (laughs) As we said in the last episode, acknowledging where you are and how you're feeling is very powerful. That is, it lets you off the hook. It lets you off the hook of like, oh, what I'm doing is bad. It's not bad. That's just where you are at the moment. And that's fine. And then you would shift these thoughts into the experience that you would like to have. So I'm loved. I'm wanted. I am worthy. I'm deserving. I'm always treated well. I'm respected and I'm deserving of that respect. And the more you repeat these thoughts is the more they become habitual. 
So the more that they become your normal state of being. And interestingly, I don't personally believe that you have to believe those thoughts in that moment because no one believes those thoughts when you change them immediately. It's like you're lying to yourself. But the way that I've heard the subconscious described recently, and I thought it was like, ah, uh, <laughs> the clouds parted and suddenly it made so much more sense. The subconscious is blind. The subconscious is not seeing the world around you. You are telling your subconscious what you are experiencing in your life, what is true for you. Your conscious mind, yeah, is active, is seeing everything. And that's why you're having those thought patterns and you're having those responses to the world around you because that is your conscious mind seeing things and taking a assumption or a perspective that's from your beliefs. But your subconscious mind, no. Your subconscious mind is a child. It does not know the world. It is not seeing the world. You have to explain to it what is true for you and what you are experiencing. So when we decide that we are loved and we're wanted and we're rich and oh, life is good, we're telling the subconscious mind, this is how it is. This is how my life is now. And the more you're saying it to that child is the more they're like, oh, okay. Yeah, that is, that is actually how my life is like. That must be what it's like. I can't see it. <laughs> so that builds up. And then your conscious thoughts start to mirror that as well. It is a layered approach. It is like taking steps. So that was like two sentences combined there. It's like taking steps because each time that you repeat that affirmation, it will build up stronger <laughs> and things around you in your life will start to change. And that's also due to the confirmation bias, which is that you always see things that support your beliefs. So as that's hardening into a belief, suddenly people are treating you better. And that might even be like anybody else looking at that situation from their perspective would say, no, no, it's, you know, it's, they're treating you exactly the same as they were before. It's like, no, 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 no. Their tone was different this time. And that is your perception. That is your confirmation bias confirming to you that yes, the person who generally spoke in an unloving tone before is now actually speaking slightly nicer to you. <laughs> so then that builds up your belief. And the more it builds up your belief is the more you persist in the thought. So it goes hand in hand. It's never a case of your external world is shut off from your internal world. It is very much a bi-directional relationship. Your internal world shifts and then your external shifts. Whereas we're very much told growing up that your external shifts and then so should your internal <laughs> which is kind of dangerous and that's where we get into the situations of determining my emotions and determining my thoughts and I'm being triggered and then responding and then it, it gets you into situations that you don't really like <laughs> I love that description and you had mentioned to me at one point, it's like teaching a child the ABCs, like it does mm -hmm. take repetition. So I love that you brought up a metaphor about it being a child again. Oh, and then intentions, which are thoughts and spoken words or, or internal dialogue that it can be a simple one-time thing. And then you can see a result or you can repeat, but it's almost like set it and forget it is steeped in more faith but even I intend that this person is going to treat me with respect or I intend that I'm going to have a great day a very powerful exercise is as soon as you wake up thinking about your what your own internal dialogue is going to be that night when you go to bed like oh my god today was so amazing I had such a good day I'm always entertained how often that goes well when I remember to do it so breaking down more about action steps, right? So we're talking about internal action steps, action steps with our thoughts. What about taking external action? The best way that I've found to take ex external action is, as you said, to set an intention, to set an intention before you take an external action. So for example, if you are going to do a test, and I used to do this during my undergraduate years when I found about manifestation just before the first year of uni is when I discovered manifestation, but that was law of attraction. And I'd set intentions. Oh, I intend this test went really well. You know, I intend that I actually remembered more answers than I thought I was going to. I intend that 
I got the grade that I wanted. I intend that good questions came up. And yeah, because you've set that intention, you go in feeling better. It also calms you down. If you're going into a situation where you care a lot, which is often the case, <laughs> setting an intention can help to kind of calm your system down. So instead of being in the fear-based response, you're in a bit more of an optimistic, like, okay, this can work out for me. And if you understand manifestation and you previously manifested things, then your faith backs it up because you've already seen results. And if it's worked for something else, then it can work for this as well. That's one thing with the law that I love is that it doesn't discriminate. And I always say this, the law does not discriminate. It will not do one thing and then not do another thing. So that can help to really encourage you. But always double check your state before you go to take an action so if you should we do a relationship example again because I feel like this is one of the most popular ones so if you are going to contact a specific person which we all love to do and we're all really eager to do and we're just like oh let me just text them I'll just text them and see how they're doing you know just just check in double check your state because sometimes you're acting from a state of, if I don't do something, nothing will happen. <laughs> or you're acting from a state of, they may have forgotten about me, so I need to just check in and make sure that they haven't. Or I haven't seen results yet. <laughs> so maybe if I just nudged them a bit, then I will see results. <laughs> or nothing has changed. <laughs> so we're coming from a state of lack and not having what we want and nothing is helping us nothing is changing so then we're trying to force something to physically happen even though our internal state from taking that action already says that we don't expect to have the results that we would like whereas if you check your state and you're actually like yeah I'm actually really confident I'm really good or sometimes when it's in, in inspired action and inspired action you won't think about it before you do it It'll be automatic. It'll be suddenly like, oh, I should text this person. Boom, you've texted them. There was no fear. There was no shaky hands. There was no deleting the text message 2,000 times. Check your state and then take external action if you like to. But that's also just being really self-aware of understanding where internally you are. And if you're in a state that is not supportive of you having what you want, that's when you take a step back, which again is an action, and care for yourself, give yourself some attention, give yourself some love, do something that you enjoy, shift that focus with your affirmations or visualization or a meditation or go for a walk, get in nature, that's your time for yourself, that is the action you should be taking in that moment and that can be physical, meditation is also still a physical action even though it's very much internal, it just yeah. crosses over so much. Another example when it comes to another person um, would be about trying to convince somebody or explain yourself to somebody. And this can be challenging for recovering or active codependence because mm -hmm. they may feel like I need to explain to this person why I ne need a boundary met, or I have to explain to this person why they hurt me or explain to a person why I'm behaving the way I am. Whereas um, a truly healthy person would recognize if another isn't capable of meeting them where they're at or isn't capable of treating them with respect, they would just back off, right? So this is a great time to really track if I'm going to have a conversation with this person because conversations and, and dialogue is important in healthy relationships. But if there's any wounding or, or dynamic of toxicity, wanting to fix it through conversation is not always the best way to handle it because the other person might not be in the state that is necessary for health. So trusting that as you tend to yourself and balance yourself into a healthy state, other people you're connected to will also rise to be in a healthy state. And sometimes just putting off conversations until that's the case um, so that feels like a similar example, but kind of more bigger than just like somebody you're interested in, um, mm -hmm. whether it be family members or, um, friends, colleagues, because a lot of us want to just like work it out, but check your state 
Like how many times have you been able to just work it out if you're triggered or you're over explaining your in codependence? Would you agree? Yeah, I would say that watching for your triggers is very important because then when you know they come up, you can sit down and look at them. But a lot of the times when we're triggered, we want to immediately react. And especially if you've been in a codependent relationship or something that hasn't been specifically healthy, just remember that the mind likes comfort. It will be comfortable in its discomfort. That's the thing. So if you're in a situation which was uncomfortable in the first place, that's just where you're used to being. So your mind might want you to react or respond in a certain way that will put you back in the same situation that you had before, even if it's not actually what you genuinely wanted. And a lot of the time with like anxious attach attachment styles or oh, avoidant, just birds of a feather flock together. They're sayings like this for a reason. If you are taking the time to focus on yourself and focus on your state and making sure that you're in a stable place, acknowledging your triggers, knowing what they are, knowing how to respond to them, then you can have better relationships. And people that support those better relationships do come into your life and people that don't do leave. So as you said, it, it is a case of look at your state, but there is a whole load of different relationship dynamics and how many times have you behaved in this way or responded in this way or reacted in this way and worked things out and it's actually benefited you in the way that you wanted it to and look at where your state was when you did that because that is so important because sometimes you want to fix something and work something out and you do come from a confident state of you know what all of my friendships are really healthy and I understand that I can go and talk to these people or my friends or my family about anything that is bothering me and we can have this conversation and it's sorted out. Fine, talk to them because you, you have that internal dialogue that you're not being triggered in that way. Whereas if you have the opposite, whereas like, I'm not heard, I'm not understood. I need to shout and scream at this person for them to hear me and understand me then reaching out is only going to mirror that. You're only going to have to shout and scream to be heard. And that is not a healthy dynamic that you want to be supporting, but it might be something that you're used to. So that might be why your mind is saying, do this, because it's it's a it's a habit, it's a thought pattern that you've yeah. just gotten used to. And another, I think another descriptor is it's familiar. So the yes. brain is comfortable with familiar, whether it likes it or not, whether it's desirable or preferable or not, it's the familiarity. It's those narrow pathways, it's grooves, right? It's hard to get out of a groove. So if you're used to being anxious in relationships and the circumstances are fine, you could still come up with a narrative that there's something to be anxious about because that is what is familiar. And that's when thoughts can, you know, intrusive thoughts can come in that are actually not true. And you could say like, no thoughts are true. We get to choose what they are, but this is when, um, we can create a narrative that can summon circumstances that finally, again, mirror back to us. See, you were right. There's something to be anxious about or same with the avoidance, right? So coming at it from, I'm first of all, like always telling the nervous system I'm safe. And then what's really going on, taking stock of what, what is true? What could this be something from my past? What am I really reacting to? Is it anything that's happened right now? Or does it feel familiar? Definitely. When, when did this start? When was my first memory of this? And that's when kind of like the introspection can be helpful so that you can detach it from the present moment and be like, okay, well, that's not who I am anymore. I am confident. Everyone I am in a relationship with is supportive, cares about me, wants to work things out. We're in harmony, et cetera. So where would you function from? What would you say if that were the case? If that were the case, then reminding yourself that 
your thoughts are always there to protect you is quite a comforting thing because sometimes we feel like our thoughts are against us or they're just jumping out of nowhere and disrupting our sleep pattern and making us anxious and making us scared and it's like oh go away some people don't like their mind and you can understand why if if they feel like their thoughts are against them but no your thoughts are actually there to protect you Mm. it's either something that they have perceived in the past your mind has perceived in the past as being harmful or being a threat to you or something that has actually happened and that has been a physical harm to you or your mind or someone that you care about or in the world because the the news does that now you watch the news and it makes you scared about things that you've never experienced but you've heard of or has been reported halfway across the world so then our thoughts come up from these memories of things that we've experienced or perceived and then we respond in a way that tries to protect us from these things possibly happening even though in this moment it isn't relevant in this moment you can be safe with the people that you are with or in your relationship but if you've had a past experience where you have been triggered because it hasn't felt safe to your mind in this healthy, safe relationship with your friends and your family, you might still be triggered. So understanding that if you are being triggered by something in your life, firstly, your mind is trying to protect you. And what is your mind trying to protect you from? That's always a nice question. What is what is the worst case scenario that your mind is trying to do right here? Is that true? Is that actually true? So I broke this down at one point. (laughs) I had a shower many years ago. And in the shower, (laughs) this thought came to me. (laughs) I was like, okay, what's the worst case scenario? First question. Okay, is that true? Yes or no? (laughs) Just yes or no. Don't overcomplicate it. (laughs) Generally, the answer is no. (laughs) If it's a yes, it's like, okay. Is there anything that I can physically do that can make myself feel safe in this moment? You could take a physical action that might be removing yourself from the situation, which if you are being physically hurt, emotionally hurt, any form of abuse, you you leave the situation. That's, that is the first point of call. If the answer is actually, you know what? No, the worst case scenario isn't present. It's like, OK, do I want to create this scenario now? <laughs> yes or no? So the, always the answer is no. <laughs> So what thought can I be supporting myself with in this moment that is creating something that I would like? Insert thought here. So you go through the breaking down of the thought because sometimes when something is scary or feels really scary to our mind, we automatically want to accept it as true for us. But when you start to question it, it turns out, no, it's not. (laughs) And then you can replace it with something that you would like to be thinking about once you know that it's not something that is actually a physical danger in that moment. What would you say to people who might be thinking, oh, this sounds like a lot of work? (laughs) You are thinking possibly over 70,000 thoughts in your day already. Your mind is already whirling. It's going away there in the background doing millions of things or 101 things <laughs> <laughs> if you heard our last episode you know why that's funny yeah you'll know why that's funny it's inside joke if you were here last time so if you understand that your mind is already doing these things it's not more work than your mind is already doing all you're doing is literally you're sitting with your mind instead of letting it do all this stuff by itself which I don't know if that cuts down on how much work it actually still feels like it is. Does that cut down on it? Well, what I like to, the way I like to frame it is, I mean, you exercise, I mean, if that's your thing to, to keep your body healthy, you try to eat mostly healthy foods rather than just eating junk all the time. You still have to eat. So you might as well put nutritious things in. Um, and it ends up benefiting you so much more that when you see the benefit, you end up enjoying it. And like you said, the brain's already working on overdrive and it's not always pleasant. So putting in some effort and it is effort at the beginning, it's like learning a new language, 
But once you learn the language, you become more fluent in it. It's, it's more automatic. You don't have to put so much mental effort into it, but it, it, you know, if you want to, if you believe that you're worthy of a better life, it, it is an investment. It's just a different kind of investment. And it's one that pays more dividends than anything I can think of. Right. Cause like you are creating a reality and it does become easier And it also might feel like, well, how do I know the right questions to ask? Or how do I know which affirmations to use to rewire my negative thinking? And that's where, you know, we come in, a coach comes in um, and just also just practicing, right? You can read books and and see how other people do it or listen to podcasts like this one and practice on your own. Um, Whatever suits you best, meeting yourself where you're at, because that's what you deserve. Exactly. And that's that's actually a perfect way a perfect way of putting it. I'm getting so tongue tied today. <laughs> that's a perfect way of putting it. And sometimes, even though things can sound complicated when they're explained, especially in like a podcast like this where we go over so many different topics and like we're bringing in psychology and logic and like subconscious mind and all the different areas, sometimes just simplify it. How can you take a small step that will benefit you today? What is one thought you can change? What is two thoughts that you can change? What is something that's important to you? And generally, relationships, health, finance, family, safe living environment, these things are important. They are your fundamental needs. It's like they're the things that we need to be actually having met in order for us to feel safe and to feel like we are living a general life satisfaction, not even like a high one, but like the foundational safety level life satisfaction. So when these things are so important to us, yes, it feels slightly daunting at the beginning and it can feel like effort, but we want them. We want the safe family and the happy family and we want the love life that looks good and feels good and we want the money and we don't want to struggle so in order to step out of those things and those areas that may not look the way we'd like them to it does take a little bit of effort at the beginning in order to shift from one place of being to another but then it becomes like riding your bike, as Becca said, or doing your ABCs or speaking another language. It becomes so natural to you that that becomes easier to be in than it would be for you at that point to switch back into the way you were before. And like we said earlier, your thoughts are already manifesting. Everything's a manifestation. This is just about conscious creatorship. So I think it'd be fun to share a couple examples of (laughs) when it worked and when it didn't. Um, well, let's just talk about today, right? This happens to me all the time. I needed a few extra minutes and I asked you if that worked for you and you actually needed even more, which was even easier for me. Um, so I found that that happens all the time. If I need extra time, I will say, oh, I don't want to bother the person. And then they end up asking for extra time or I really don't want to do this today. Just a fleeting thought. And then they cancel happens all the time. And because I see that it happens all the time, it's almost a belief that when I need more time, that will happen. And so it, ha- it happens more and more because where you focus on is where the energy is flowing and that's what is being cultivated. So we we both mutually experienced that today. So I don't know, chicken. Yeah. That was a multiple manifestation though, because on my side, I was looking at the time and I was like, ah, oh about 10 minutes left this is coming a little bit fine I could use a little bit more time like my system needed updating and I'd been putting it off and I thought okay no this kind of needs to be done but I don't want to be late for this meeting and then you said five more minutes like five extra minutes and I was like hey (laughs) that's perfect timing and then you asked me and I said I was running behind and then it was like 15 more minutes and it worked out perfectly And then, you know, a typical example that I feel like is overused, but it's real is parking. I just always intend to have perfect parking and I can't think of times I don't get it anymore. I mean, for years, it's just 
people just pull out and I get the front seat, <laughs> front row parking, not front seat, front parking. And um, it's so simple. And, and what Ailey said about just choosing one or two thoughts a day, you can even say, I intend to have more ease with conscious creation. I intend to feel better today than yesterday and leave it. You don't have to obsess. In fact, obsessing um, can cause more resistance because what you want is to feel the natural state. You are already manifesting everything you're thinking, but you're not thinking about it because it's natural. So just gently starting to shift what those natural thoughts are will change your reality. It doesn't have to be this forceful thing, but when people find out about it, they can tend to go a little overboard sometimes. And then it begins to counter be counterproductive because it's not natural, it's forced. So I have a couple more examples of natural stuff. Um, and please forgive me. I do shop on Amazon. I'm not proud of it. Um, but at the beginning of COVID, when most people were starting to shift over to Amazon, I returned something or tried to return something and they gave me a full refund and told me to keep the product. Now, every single time I ever return something, they tell me to keep it and to give me a refund. I don't even need to return it. Um, on the small occasion when, you know, I've, I've kind of <laughs> learned the ins and outs of how that works. Um, but anyway, I'll leave it there. And it, it's gone above and beyond Amazon. Like if I have uh, another company, I had my couch delivered um, and the delivery people scuffed up the whole entryway of my house and I tipped them and I didn't even notice till they left. And I ended up telling the company, um, the couch company, and they said, we'll handle it and we'll give you um, a refund, a partial refund for the couch as a sorry. And then I was supposed to follow up with the delivery company, but I was having trouble with them. So I called back the couch company and they said, we're so sorry. Would you mind if we gave you an extra thousand dollars off? And I was thinking, what do you mean? Do I mind? Like the repairs aren't even worth a thousand dollars. I it made no sense. And, and, and they acted like I was doing them a favor. So I ended up, you know, getting $1,500 off this purchase. And this happens all the time where companies just offer me money, um, where I get these huge vouchers or people give me things for free. And it's happened for so many years in terms of getting things for free, um, that it's just autopilot for me. Like, I don't even really think about it until I start getting into conscious manifestation and was reverse engineering it oh my God, I do expect to get things for free or on deep sales. So it's just part of my day-to-day -day life now. If I really want something, I'll go to the store and oftentimes it's on sale. And it's just because it's happened a few times, it became my normal assumption and it, it didn't take any effort. It was just the natural pattern of things. So to reverse engineer this, what are things that you'd love to happen often and just have a simple thought about it. I wonder if I would always get sales on big ticket items and just see what that's like. And you can make a list of this stuff. Um, and I, and I mentioned this in the last episode of making a list of just random things you'd want to see. So one of the things that's always on my list is owls. I just love owls. And this is a little bit faith-based, but I was in the woods the other day and I was feeling down and I was acknowledging that I felt down. So I said, God, speak to me in a way that I can hear. And I shared this on the last episode. I think that I'm like redefining what God is for me. I've decided it's this frequency that we can co-create with. It's this frequency that is running through everything and that we can summon and command. Um, and it knows better than us. Like it, it doesn't necessarily have an intelligence, but when you said that everything comes true, it often doesn't look like we think it will. And that's because of this other energy nature we're creating with. So anyway, I digress. I said, God speak to me in a language I can understand. And within a minute, I started hearing owls calling to each other in the woods. And this was like daytime. It was like three or 4 PM not unheard of, but uncommon for owls. And I just, I couldn't believe it. Here were two owls speaking to each other. And I said, speak to me in a language I can hear. And I got it. And another kind of nature thing for me, which is very powerful for me, 
I shared this with you earlier, Ailey, that there was a wounded deer that came to my property twice and I was worried about it. And I called the cops and they said the only option is that they can come shoot it, but they would leave it on the property. I was hoping maybe there was some rehab available, but there wasn't. So I sat down to pray and I said, if it's, you know, this deer's destiny, can you please help it heal? And it, if not, like if it's better for it to die, can you help it be more comfortable? And I was, I had my eyes closed. I was really like tapping into that. And then I felt antsy. So I opened my eyes and looked out and the deer was starting to get up and it started to forage a little bit and then it disappeared. And I haven't seen it since. So whether or not it's even an intention for ourselves or just working with the environment, the field around us, start practicing whatever you're inspired to say, because it's really miraculous to see the world respond. And another fleeting thing like that is I love this show Pose. Have you ever seen it? It's a it's a three part series. It's about I think I've heard of it. It's about um the black drag scene in the seventies in New York City. It is phenomenal. And I have a friend who's very creative. And I said to her, I want you to watch Pose. And she was like, What are you talking about? And the next day, I get a text from her, and she said, My professor just assigned us to watch the series Pose. And this is not a new show. It's not like it's trending. <laughs> Um, so just things like that, start to notice these patterns, what people call coincidences. But if you focus on them more and celebrate them, you're going to start seeing more. And like we talked about with the reticular activating system, yes, you're seeing it more because you're looking for it more, but it's also happening more if you, if you want to play this lifestyle. I have a bunch more um, examples, but I want you to share a couple. Your examples, it's funny. We have some similar ones. So refunds, yep. Amazon, yep. Um, it's Literally, like everyone, let us know, audience. Are you guys all getting these refunds on Amazon? Maybe it's not special. Maybe, <laughs> but that's my perception. In my narrative, it's special. <laughs> yeah, and getting free things or getting discounts. Or I do it with, um, if there's something I would like, I make an intention for it. Again, the only time I think that you should be repeating something is if it's something that you really want and you know that generally when you're thinking about that topic, the thoughts are not what you would want to experience. So like the deer, for example, you weren't having a lot of opposite thoughts about the deer like months, weeks beforehand. It wasn't like a thought pattern even like Amazon there's not really much thought patterns there like a whole load to change so sometimes yeah an attention is great Uh, like you're always getting a parking space when I was going to my undergraduate university it was outside of London so sometimes I would commute from home because I live in London to Reading where I did my undergrad and sometimes I would be doing this during rush hour and now if you've been in London during rush hour you understand you cannot move sometimes it is like your face somebody else's armpit like (laughs) together (laughs) squished like you have to move in there's like no space don't even breathe (laughs) when you're on the tube or on the train so I decided one of those days that I was going to set an intention I always get a seat (laughs) I always get a seat, especially because I was having to do like train, tube, tube, longer train, bus, bus. Yeah, it was a long journey. I always get a seat. And I kept repeating that every time I was going to get a train. And then suddenly, even in rush hour, in like the most busy times, there would always be a seat. And it wasn't people looking at me and thinking, huh, she needs a seat. It was always a case of when I got on the train, there was always one seat available and it always seemed to be that other people getting on either got a different seat or didn't want to sit there or were just getting off like it always worked out in my favor so I was never having to stand for like an extensive journey which was just something it was nice it was a nice little comfort thing I was just like oh yes I got to my two suitcases and my backpack and here we go I get to sit down not just stand for a whole hour <laughs> but 
it's something simple and think of a different one. So well, I, I love that one because it shifts your feeling state too. So it's not just about the thing because oh, I'm, you're not, you're not stressed. You're not dreading the train. You're actually in a place of calm, like, oh, it's going to be comfortable. Really and like- I didn't believe it at the beginning when I set the intention there was very little evidence to say that this was going to happen. And then suddenly the seat started turning up and it turned up once and then it turned up twice and then three times. And then suddenly I was like, huh, maybe I do always get a seat. So then I start to have even more like confidence in it. And then, yep, definitely always get a seat. And I still always get a seat now <laughs> because it's just such a natural relief. I was driving cross country, across the United States, and I took a wrong turn and I ended up at Niagara Falls, <laughs> the Canadian border. And when I realized this was happening and it was getting dark and I'd been driving for so many hours, I was so sore and stiff. I wanted to soak in a tub. So I called a hotel and they said that they were out of, I don't know if I asked if they had a hot tub and they said it was closed or I asked if they had a room with a hot, uh, with a bathtub, but they said that they were out. One of those two were true. I wasn't going to get to soak that night. And I said, well, just book me for your last room. And I get there and they said, I'm sorry, there's been a change of rooms. There's only, as you know, there's only one room left in the house, but um, it's actually the honeymoon suite. Are you okay with that? And I get there and there's a huge red heart-shaped jacuzzi tub. (laughs) And you better believe I soaked in that thing for a long time that night, just laughing and taking pictures. I couldn't believe it at the time. It was years ago. Um, But things like that, just, I I didn't think I was going to get it. I was bummed, but it showed up. Yeah. So Sometimes it works out in a way that you wouldn't have expected it to. As you said before, the possibilities are endless as to how things can happen. And you don't have to know how. Where sometimes we try to micromanage and make sure that it's a specific way that it's happening. And then we get really frustrated or upset when things don't look like they're happening in that way that we want them to. But that doesn't mean that things aren't still working out for you. And that's quite a lovely thing. I have one more example I want to share that's probably the best example of my life. So hopefully people have listened this long. Um, I was diagnosed with an autoimmune disease when I was 11 years old, and it's called Hashimoto's thyroiditis. It's an autoimmune condition where the body attacks the thyroid. It thinks that the, something's wrong. And so it starts to shut the thyroid down. And then you have to take supplemental thyroid hormones. So I've been taking thyroid hormones since I was 11. And a couple months ago, I reawakened my interest in Joe Dispenza, Dr. Joe Dispenza, who talks about meditation and you can heal anything in your body. And in the past, I've dabbled in this stuff, but felt frustrated because I have tried everything under the sun to heal this thing. Shamanism, herbalism, dietary shifts. I guess I never really committed to mindset shifts until recently. So I did a few months ago, actually less than a few months ago. I feel like a month ago, I decided to start affirming every time I took that darn hormone pill, this is going to be temporary. My doctor is going to think that it's a miracle when I get my blood results next. And I'm only taking this because it's the safest way to wean off of it. But soon I won't need it. Soon my antibodies are going to drop and I will be free of this disease. Now, this is a cool story, not only because of the current results, but it's an example of manifesting back in time. So like quantum manifestation, that when we start to shift our thoughts today, it can affect the future, but it can also affect the past. So bear with me. So I went and got my blood work done. I think I was affirming for less than six weeks, to be honest, Um, because I got my blood work done six weeks apart. So yeah, maybe four weeks I was saying this to myself every morning when I took my pill. And my blood work um, was that I cut my antibodies down in half and they reduced my thyroid hormone by 20%. Now I've been taking this thyroid hormone for 27 years and they've only ever risen the dose. So that's a goddamn miracle. And I set my intentions. So 
um, yeah, soon enough, I won't need it. And I went back to go look at a chart of my past test results to prove to myself how dramatic this was. And what I noticed was, yes, the most recent results are very dramatic and obviously for my mindset shift, but over the years it had been getting better. So the chart is a, a decline which is against what the doctors say. They say it's degenerative and with time it will get worse. So not only was I able to create this manifestation right away, but I also had changed the past. Does that make sense? Yeah. It's like called revision. Revision. And I have another story that's similar to that, that somebody else told me where she had prayed for her client who had been abused and the client hadn't told her this, but she could sense it. And she prayed and she had a vision that she was like looking down on her client in a very bad situation. And the client ended up sharing with her the next week what happened when she was a kid and that she looked up in the corner of the room and saw an angel. So I just got chills saying that. So basically what happened was my friend was praying for her and had this vision of being up in the corner of the room. And really this girl had a, a memory of an angel praying or being in her presence up in the corner of the room back when she was a kid. So it's like time travel. And I mean, I feel like the details of it were so specific. It, you can't deny it. You can't say it, it was just a coincidence. So revision. Yeah. What is re revision? What is revision? So revision is essentially where you use your thoughts and you use your focus in order to change your perception of something that happened in the past. So because you persist with the focus of having had a different situation, it actually shifts. And then people start to say different things and situations start to look different. So an example I had of revision with a client or a friend I'm not sure which but their dog was getting old and they were starting to get a bit upset because as dogs get older you know things are things are coming <laughs> and she didn't want that to be the case so I think her dog was 14 and she kept saying no my dog is 10 <laughs> My dog is 10. My dog is 10. My dog's 10. Like ignoring anybody else because the dog's birthday was coming up as well. And then when she later on asked her family around the dog's birthday, what, how old is the dog? They all looked at her and said 10, even though they'd all been saying that she was 14 in the first place. So it was a bit of a, yeah, situation change where everybody around her suddenly also said the same thing that she'd been intending, even though before that point, they were very, very sure. Like the vet said, this dog's 14. The family said, this dog's 14. <laughs> and then suddenly it shifts because our revision of the situation begins to match. And that could, oh, we can go into so much talking about revision, like, quantum physics and multiple realities and how time is not linear that is just I love talking about how time isn't linear it's like if you've seen Doctor Who <laughs> okay Doctor Who in the UK he flies around in a TARDIS which is a box <laughs> and he like the version of Doctor Who with David Tennant he says like wibbly wobbly timey wimey where time is not linear it's like time fluctuates and that's why he's able to move through time so certain books and certain stories when they start to talk about time in a different way make me now like huh maybe you actually know a bit more than you were actually letting on here because our perception of time being very much a to b something happened in the past, present and future. Our mind can only ever experience something in the present. Time is not linear. It is not happening in a moment in this second and then it happens in another second. Everything happens simultaneously. Oh, we can get so much. There's, there's too much to discuss there. <laughs> and, you know, one way to look at manifestation is you're just timeline hopping. 
So you don't even have to change yourself or others. You're just jumping into a reality where that's true. Yeah. Yeah. Because one of the views from Neville Goddard, and I think there's a couple of different manifestation and law of assumption teachers that have this perception is that creation is finished and you are just selecting a version of reality reality that you want to experience and this leaps over into quantum physics and multiple realities and different time continuums and how there is just multiple versions of reality happening exactly in this moment and we are actually shifting from reality to reality by selecting it I love yeah. it. I love it. And I think that, um, and I'm not sure this is connected, but it came up, uh, that the more people who carry the same opinion with you, the faster it will shift. Ooh, I haven't heard that one. So before. I'm going to ask the audience to imagine me free of disease. Because I do believe that this is true. And I mean, I think that that's why so many religious people believe in prayer because, and a lot of religious people believe that there's a higher power or God that's responding to them because whatever helps you to believe more Mm -hmm. is going to make it work. So if you're surrounded by people who doubt you, it takes a lot more gumption, a lot more confidence in yourself to hold that true and not let other people's point of view impose on you or seep into you. But if they all believe, if they all hold that view, which is really what culture and society is, right? Common beliefs, mm-hmm. like reality. So get you some people who believe in you, believe in this and play around, like intend together and see what shows up. And feel free to reach out and let us know what you are manifesting. And then we can talk about it when it appears. Yes. And yes. We will be supporting you through that. But I just thought of a success as well. Shall I I add in here? So when I had finished my undergraduate, I did like a couple of different diplomas. I wasn't sure what I wanted to do. Psychotherapy, counseling. I kind of jumped around, kind of testing the waters. And then I realized I didn't really want to do that. (laughs) So I set an intention. I was like, oh, I intend that I'm doing a course that I really love. And I intend that it is funded. I didn't know what this course was going to be and I'd looked into different masters and I didn't see anything I liked and then one day I just got this kind of tinkering in the back of my mind it was like oh search search this specific search (laughs) so like use these specific words in your search so then I typed in like um psychology and the well-being and something specific and then um, my master's popped up I had never seen this master's considering how hard I was trying before trying to find the course trying to search like trying to be doing something it hadn't come up and then suddenly it came up and it was the master's in applied positive psychology and coaching psychology I hadn't heard of positive psychology at this point so I click on it because curiosity and the deadline has passed so I look at it and I'm like but this looks so good. No, I intend I'm doing this course. It looks so good. It's funded. It's right down my avenue. This looks good. I intend I'm doing it. I applied. I was late. And I got in. (laughs) Even though I was late, I was past the deadline. And then I had issues with admissions. So I was even later. And at one point, they were like, we might actually have to let you join next time because they've already started doing the lectures and I was like no 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 no. I started my master's already in my mind I intend I've started this master's and then they came back and said to me okay no no we've got everything it's fine we'll just add you on now so I added on late was accepted late and joined just in time for them to do a refresher first class for the people who had missed it amazing yeah So things can look like they're not going your way at certain points, and it still can. And congratulations, by the way, on your results. So pleased. Very exciting. And I, you know, I used to think, why, 
why aren't I healing? Like I would ask that question a lot years ago. Like, what is the root of this? And one of the many ideas I came up with was, well, what are you going to, how are you going to feel if you could have healed and you took this long to do it? And I really had to hold myself in conviction. I don't care how many years it takes. I'm me now and I don't want this forever. So we're going to do it and it's happening fast. Mm-hmm. You know, it, so conviction, ease, naturalness, conviction. Those are probably, if I had to pick three, the states that really push things forward. Mm-hmm. So those, those are your free key keywords i pulled that out of nowhere (laughs) i don't know i agree with them though they're good words and i'd probably say dedication persistence and joy i love it because thinking about it should bring you joy entertaining the idea of you being in the way you want to be and that is you being healthy and enjoying your life that should feel good So even though you have to persist and it is a dedication to yourself and to that life that you want to live, it should feel joyful to a certain extent. And that reminds me of one more tip I wanted to offer when it came to um, shifting from love to unlove. That was the conversation we were having. So any, any mood you want, what would put you in that mood? So whether it's music or Mm -hmm. watching a movie or a person in your life that helps you feel that way create more emotions. That's when you can use emotion to your advantage um, that help you resonate more and more because again, the dominant state is what creates. So if you can generate more and more of this, it will, you'll create momentum. Yeah. I love that. That's a good idea. That's such a nice way to feel good about something as well. And the way I actually like to do this is Pinterest. I have a Pinterest board called The Woman I Am Now. <laughs> oh, and it's actually got like dresses in it and like lifestyle and places I've been and foods that I've eaten. And it's funny because I started it ages ago. But when I was scrolling through it the other day, I had to move some of those things from Pinterest into a manifested already section because things had already shown up. So in the US people might call that a vision board. Yes, that is one great tool. And then on the other side of it, um, be mindful of what you're listening to and what you're watching. Like, are the lyrics of the music perpetuating narratives that are negative? Are the movies that you're watching keeping unpleasant imagery in your mind? So, you know, the one way to to call all of what we're talking about is a mental diet, yes. making sure that what you're feeding your brain actually facilitates the reality you want yeah or making sure that you understand that the content that you are accepting at this moment clearly defining to yourself that this is not real Mm. (laughs) this movie because I occasionally do like to dabble in like a little bit of Korean horror (laughs) (laughs) I do not want to experience that in my life I make it very clear to myself the train to Busan or train to Busan is not happening in real life but it is a brilliant movie you know so make it very clear to yourself music I think is a slightly more tricky area because some of the lyrics in certain songs and the emotion that it provokes and you start to relate to that is sticky and the news as well can be like that yeah and so when I watch the news I I do I remind myself it's important to know what's going on for other human beings but I don't have to take it into my nervous system you know I do try to create some sort of boundary because you don't want to just shut out being knowledgeable about things that are required for people to know about to make change Um, And to be responsible citizens at the same time, you don't want to suck it in like a sponge. So that is a little bit more difficult. And I love the way you painted a picture of how you can watch something and not allow it to nav, you know, influence you to that degree. And then with music, I thought I was bypassing that by listening to the vitamin string quartet. Do you know them? They play all the pop songs, the best pop songs, like all the modern songs only with um, orchestra instruments, no, no words. Um, Mm -hmm. but 
I already know the words. So I still feel the vibration. So some of those toxic lyrics, like sometimes I'm like, no, 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 I'm just listening to the music, but I can feel the, already the narrative of the song. So I might click next or I might just say, no, this isn't my life. It's just a great, got a great tune to it. The lyrics are just happen to be entertaining, but it's not reality. So yeah, this is when you can start to cherry pick um, your attitude towards things. Um, you don't have to live in a bubble of positivity, but when you're new at it, when you are kind of creating, let's say like put it in a garden analogy. If you want to make the soil nutritious and free of pests, you got to clear it out, compost it first, and then you can start to put in the perennial plants and create more of a multi-storied um garden so that it's self-sustaining if you guys are into sustainability maybe that went over some people's heads but um setting the ground for a resilient and thriving atmosphere for yourself is important but once you have that in place and you understand how these laws work for you and you have confidence and and self-respect then you can navigate anything that life hands to you because life is never going to be this like perfect joyful thing life is going to continue to have challenge and, and trigger, but it's how you navigate it. And with, with your orientation toward it, that's going to change the way you experience it. Definitely. That is spot on. And to add on to that, I think it's understanding how you're triggered because if certain things really trigger you, you don't have to keep them in your life. You can choose to watch the films, but not listen to just like specific music or you don't watch the news, but you'll read articles now and then because it doesn't trigger you in the same way. So for example, I know that I'm very triggered by the news. I don't watch the news very often. And I trust that anything that I need to know will be told to me. And that's always been the case. Someone else will always tell me about a situation or something that's happened around the world that I need to know about. So I think I found out about COVID from someone else not the news <laughs> yeah but that was in the time that I needed to know it because it was at the beginning it was something so urgent and so pressing that everybody knew about it that I knew about it at the beginning as well I wasn't behind I was probably a day out but except for that I knew <laughs> so I trusted that because I do absorb so much when I watch the news and I always come away feeling sick or horrible or just like the next few days I feel unwell or I feel scared about life or like I understand how that triggers me so I don't watch it that often but I put the bar barrier the boundary in place for that for myself but with other things I know that I can watch occasional scary films or watch Game of Thrones with like one eye closed or like just you know watch something or listen to specific music and it doesn't affect me in the same way it doesn't affect my health or my mental state or make it more difficult to focus internally and be in a good space so see what triggers you understand what triggers you and make changes dependent on that nothing is wrong nothing is right whatever works for you is perfect it all comes down to choice choice and agency well we this was meant to be a shorter episode but we clearly had plenty to talk about so if you have any questions reach out to us if this uh, was inspiring to you if you know somebody that this could benefit please send it their way and um, the way to get a hold of us will be in the show description and Ailey thank you so much for joining me again this is so much fun thank you for having me it was so much fun and it's always lovely talking to you. I'll see you next time. Yeah. Bye. Okay. Thank you for listening and becoming part of this community. If you love this episode, I invite you to subscribe, share with someone you think would appreciate it, or leave a review. This helps me to learn what resonates with you so I can deliver more of what you want and reach more people who can benefit from this content. If you want to reach me, please feel free to reach out on my website, www.beccaspirit.com. I would love to hear from you, get any feedback, and know what's on your mind. Until next time, take great care. <laughs>